the second foundational philosophies of qualitative research that I would like to discuss is phenomenology. And again, phenomenology might be a reason never to leave the library again, because there's a huge amount of books that have been written about phenomenology, and they are pretty hard to read also. So probably you will spend some years in library if you really want to grasp the essence of phenomenology. And probably phenomenology is just about that. Phenomenology started out in the early 20th century, late 19th century. And uh, it started out mainly in German language countries uh, among professors working at universities, philosophers working at universities such as Husserl, Scheler, and later uh, Edith Stein or uh, Merleau-Ponty and Schutz. And what they tried to do in phenomenology was some kind of a positive science in the sense that as other contemporaries, they tried to place their philosophies against the metaphysical background of 19th century and especially earlier philosophies. So what they tried to do was to have a rather empirical philosophy of science or philosophy. And what do phenomenologists do? What is phenomenology? Well, phenomenology tries to get the pure meaning of a phenomenon. And they say it can only be understood subjectively and intuitively and then grasp in its essence. So it tries to grasp the pure meaning of a phenomenon in its essence, intuitively and subjectively. And some would even say, for instance, Edith Stein would say through Einfühlen, through empathy. So only through empathy we can understand each other. Whereas other phenomenologists would say, no, not at all. We have to use our logic as well. And it's not just empathy. So there's a huge range of phenomenologists, but the central idea is to grasp pure meaning in its essence subjectively. And there's a second aspect. And the second aspect is that phenomenologists study the conscious experience and not just a conscious experience of anything, not just armchair philosophy. No, they try to study conscious experience of something. When you think, you think about something and therefore you are, not just because you think. And they look at how subjects, people, members of societies, actors, whatever you call them, as well as researchers experience these phenomena consciously. So this consciousness is an important word as well as is of something because you're conscious about something. So phenomenology is about trying to grasp the meaning of a phenomenon consciously by using experience. Phenomenologists do this phenomenology, do this interpretation. Well, there are different strands of phenomenology. And as a grandparent of many strands of qualitative research philosophies or ideas such as ethnomethodology or ethnophenomenology or phenomenography, it plays a huge role in contemporary qualitative research. But how do phenomenologists do phenomenology? How do they do their interpretations? Well, in general, there are three different methods of interpretations in phenomenology, according to Woodruff Smith. Um, the first is a pure description of a lived experience. How does that work? Well, for instance, if your cat has died, then you feel the loss for that cat. Or maybe you're happy about it, I don't know. But you feel the loss uh, of losing your cat. So what you try to do as a phenomenologist is try to describe this loss and this feeling of loss as pure as you can. So it's a pure description of a lived experience. Now that's one way. It's the first step. A second step or a second method is trying to interpret the kind of experience by relating it to a relevant context. So relating it to the loss of people probably, or the loss of 
other animals uh, or other pets that you had. And you try to look at it in a certain context. The loss of your cat, it is terrible, but probably the loss of a person near you is much more terrible. So you try to put it in a context. You try to interpret the kind of experience, a feeling of loss, feeling of losing an animal or a person or whatever. And then you try to analyze the form of the experience. So you try to analyze um, how this feeling of loss works. Probably for different persons, probably for you as a researcher or as a person yourself. So that's the third step. And it's the classical triad between description, interpretation and analysis. All qualitative research has description, interpretation, as well as analysis. But then again, how does this work? Because you have this description, this interpretation and this analysis, but, and you try to grasp the essence of a meaning, but how do you do this? Well, the central word in phenomenology is the word introduced by Husserl, and that word is bracketing. How does this work? Well, we take the world around us as natural. And as phenomenologists, we, when we try to grasp the essence of a meaning, we place the naturalness between brackets. So we act as if it is just an appearance of loss rather than loss itself. It's an appearance of loss. And we try to analyze this loss for this animal, for this cat, as an appearance in order to grasp the real essential part of this phenomenon. Now that sounds pretty vague, doesn't it? And it's pretty hard and it's still philosophy, still a bit armchair philosophy, hypothetical situations. Now, Alfred Schutz, who was a banker during the daytime, was a brilliant philosopher and social scientist at night. Because what he did was he tried to apply the, the ideas of Husserl and Scheler, but also James, and he was corresponding with Talcott Parsons at the same time. So he was embedded in social science. And what he tried to do was to, do, to create a phenomenology of the social world. And what he says is, well, if we take this bracketing and if we look at how people in their daily life act towards the world. They act towards the world as if it is natural to them. Of course, because otherwise you go nuts. If you go around and when you meet people, you continuously think, okay, this is just an appearance. There's something else behind it. You'll get crazy. So we act towards the world as if it is natural. And in order to do so, we use typifications of people, but also of situations. So let's say someone comes up to me and says, well, my cat has died. I will try to support that person because that's the typical recipe. Oh, my cat has died. Oh, I'm so sorry for you. And how old was your cat? And there are rules about how to do this, how to give this support. Talk about the cat a bit and why it was such a nice animal or, or not. And it would be really weird if someone says, my cat has died and I'm so happy about it because he ruined my couch or something like that. That's untypical, but it is a reaction, but it's not the standard recipe. So the standard recipe is to support people. And what we do, what we call this in phenomenology is first order constructs. So people typify the world and we call these typifications first order constructs. And we do this in interaction. Now, Schutz says, if we use first order constructs as laypersons, as members of society, then what do we use as scientists, as social scientists? So as social scientists, we still use constructs, but we try to use constructs that go beyond the naturalness. And therefore, as phenomenological social scientists, we use doubt and bracketing, continuous doubt. Now, if we have first order constructs, 
obviously, we also have second order constructs. And these con second order constructs are the constructs we as social scientists use. And these are slightly different from these first order constructs because we use theory. And we try to go beyond the naturalness. We try to go beyond the appearances. And we put brackets around it and we use doubt. And by doing that, we create constructs that are on a slightly higher level than the normal level of typifications. But they're still typification. And one can discuss whether this is a total construction as well. And later, phenomenologists did exactly that.